The Human Brain Project is a European flagship project. It was conceived around 2009, 2010, and it combines, I would say, one of the biggest scientific challenge with the technology that is growing faster than any other. Uh, the scientific challenge, of course, is to understand the human brain. And there are many reasons why you want to understand the human brain. Uh, is the basic science question. We just have to understand who we are. But there is a very practical aspect also, and that is connected to brain diseases. We want to understand brain diseases and we want to find ways to cure them. Now the fast growing technology I'm referring to is the computing technology. Computing technology is growing very rapidly and so there is a two-way interaction between brain science and computing technology in the Human Brain Project. Brain science can actually help to develop future computing technology. We know a lot about deep learning and we think deep learning is somehow inspired by biology but currently there is a very little inspiration from biology. The artificial neural networks that we use don't have to do a lot with how the brain works. So one of the goals of the Human Brain Project is to use knowledge from neuroscience and to build brain-like computers that really implement many, many of the latest discoveries, in particular concerning learning and self-organization of the brain. And the other way, of course, is that we use computers as they are in particular, the capability to analyze large data volumes, to analyze brain data. There is so much brain data being taken now with very advanced images, imaging techniques that this is a gold mine for data analysis. So in, in summary, the Human Brain Project brings together computer science and neuroscience and it's an interaction in both directions. Now, neuromorphic computing tries to build computers that are like brains to some extent. Does it mean we build artificial brains? Certainly not. What we do is we take aspects from brain science that we think we understand and turn that into novel computing architectures. So what are those aspects? One is that the brain is a densely connected network of neurons and synapses. This we know for sure and there are models for it. And what, one thing we do is to copy that network structure into special computers, in particular also into special computing hardware. Uh, then, of course, there is an interesting aspect about neural networks in the brain, and that is that they are able to learn. They learn by interacting with the outside world. And that is probably the most important aspect of neuromorphic computing. We want to make neuromorphic computing systems that learn similar to the biological brain. That means in contrast to ongoing current deep learning activities, we don't want to split between a training phase and an inference phase, but we want to build systems that learn continuously as long, as soon as there is new input coming into the system, the knowledge is being updated. So learning is the key feature. There are some other aspects of neuromorphic computing that are also important. One, of course, is the energy efficiency. We know that our brain is extremely energy efficient. We can just live from a little bit of food for a whole day and do amazing things. This is very different from the modern computers that we have. They are extremely energy hungry. And so that, of course, in particular for mobile devices, would be a game changer. Then there's another aspect which is often forgotten. Our brain is very fault tolerant. We lose about one brain cells per second. That's 100,000 per day. And still, we kind of function reasonably well. If you would kill a transistor in a microprocessor per second, it would stop working immediately, basically. There is almost no fault tolerance. And why is that interesting? Well, we know that we want to make smaller and smaller transistors, and uh, the transistor makers, for them, it's increasingly difficult to make them all work. So to have a computer architecture that is capable of working with imperfect devices or even non-functioning devices would also be extremely important for future technologies. Well, novel technologies have always been a threat from the beginning. It's true for the steam engine. It's true for the car that replaced the horses. So there was always the fear the new technology uh, changes the world, and it will certainly change the world. 
and uh, artificial intelligence is changing the world today. Uh, it can also have, as it has been for the steam engine and for the cars, very positive effects because there is a better means of transportation. People do not have to do the dirty work, but they can focus on the more pleasant things in life. And I think if we do it right, if we do it right, artificial intelligence can be used in a very similar way. It can help us to do the things that are boring, that are less creative, and we can leave the, the interesting and nice things to the humans. In order to do that, it is essential that we make sure that we understand and we control the way this technology is evolving. We should not leave it just to a few companies that do the development behind open doors, uh, but the development of AI should be open. You know, probably there is an initiative in the US which is called Open AI, which I support very much. And I also think projects like the Human Brain Project, with their openness and their willingness to communicate the research process to the public, can contribute to make AI a technology that we can use for the best of all humans. As I said before, I think the strengths of the Human Brain Project, one strength is its openness and its ability and willingness to communicate with society. Uh, another strength of the Human Brain Project is the fact that we work very closely with neuroscientists. So for us, AI is not just a technological development, but it's really always coupled, coupled with the wish to understand how the brain works. This is something which I think makes the, the European Human Brain Project special. Now having said that, I know that in China, people do similar things. There are Chinese brain projects that will do the same thing. They will also bring together neuroscience with computer science. Uh, now, what I strongly believe is, I believe in communication and in exchange of ideas and science. I think it's important that we integrate Chinese scientists, in particular young Chinese scientists, PhD students, postdoc into research and development in Europe and in the US. So that at the end, we really address this challenge together and we do not try to separate ourselves from China. I think that would be a mistake.